Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and look at verse 8. And I want you to remember something. This message is for me. I wrote it for me. It's got me in mind. And I've, I've said this before. Don't put too much Yep, it's on now. Don't put too much stock in me. Don't put too don't put too many flowers on me. Don't put don't pin too many don't pin any medals on me. And don't ever replace me for Jesus, the Holy Spirit, for God. Don't do it. When I came to this church, I was a sinner. When I leave this church, I will leave that sinful body behind. But while it's still here, it's the same body. And... Um, and I've told people before, if you put too much praise in me, stock in me, whatever, God, God, will, God will bring me down in your sight on purpose. He'll do it. I don't want that. I don't, I don't want the praise. I don't mind the love. Everybody needs love. I don't mind the friendship. I think we've got good love and good friendship in this church right now. Some of us have been here when the devil was trying to tear this place apart. And I can tell you it's a whole lot better now. A whole lot better. So as you look at 1 Peter 3, 8, think of this. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Listen, if the lost people at the Walmart pharmacy, I don't even know their names, if they can care enough about Lisa and I, and, they're, and, and probably lost people. Why can't God's people do at least that? If not more. And I'm not asking you for nothing for me. I got an insurance company. Don't worry about it. Okay? But having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Care about other people's needs instead of just your own. Be courteous. Say, may I, may I sit here next to you? May I, may I help you with something? Can I pray for you today? Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that you are there and too called that you should in inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto the prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Who is he that will harm you if, if you be followers of that which is good? Who can hurt you? They couldn't hurt Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Abed 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. There we go. Amen. You know, them three guys. Mishael. What was the other two names? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That was their Hebrew names. Now watch this. But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. This is what I, this is what I wanted to read to you. If you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with weakness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Now you look at verse 17. And only you can know this. This is between you and God. It is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. I mean, if you're getting slammed hard and it just seems like everything's coming against you, but you're living a life of sin, don't, don't go around going, Oh, I'm suffering such persecution for the Lord Jesus Christ. No, you're not. God's trying to whoop you until you wake up. Trust me, I know. Uh, for, look at uh, verse 18. For Christ also has suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit. So, the people that are suffering... The first thing you ask yourself is, is this because of something I did? Or is this because of, of, it's, just the, it's just the devil getting after me? Now, I've had people ask me questions. I remember a lady went to church here. And her dad died suddenly. I was there at the hospital when it happened. And she had had her children out of, before wedlock. And it was like 15 years ago before her, before her dad died. And she came and asked me, she said, do you think this happened because of that? And I asked her, I said, has God forgiven you? She said, yes. I said, then why would God whoop you 15, later, 15 years later for a sin you committed 15 years ago? Why would God do that? Now God, in my experience, whips you while you're in the process of the sin to get you to repent. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. And God knows how to make us sorry. Somebody say amen. Boy, does God know how to make us sorry. Now, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. I'm, I'm just going to preach this chapter. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. We have some elders, Brother Sterling, Brother Chris, I consider you an elder. You are a man who has been through life. You have 
been, been in the high places and been in the low places. You've suffered, but you've also praised. And I consider you one of those elders. We need that those men with wisdom. Brother Roy is one of those. So we need our the the trend of the churches has been for the last 30 years to run the old people off. I've read it in the books. I've I've seen them I've seen Rick Warren say it. You know why he wanted to run them off? God said, seek ye the old paths. Who is it that knows where all the old paths are? The old people. They're, they're the ones who lived in town all their life. And they'll tell you, you know, there used to be a road that used to go right through there. And there used to be a, there used to be a restaurant right over there. They'll tell you all that stuff. They tell you that stuff all day long. They know the old paths, don't they? The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. But now listen to this, not by constraint. A, a, neither a pastor or a deacon board, or a board of trustees, are the church dictators. That's what that means. Not by constraint. Uh, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Love the people that God has put in our charge. Love the sweet little lambs that God has given to us to take care of and to feed them and to watch over them. That's our responsibility. It's to make sure they're fed, to make sure they're taken care of, to make sure they're loved. Often we fail in that. Um... Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre. I won't, I won't say the name. But I used to watch a man in this church who did a little job in this church. This is, this is going back a long time ago, so you, you wouldn't even, probably wouldn't even know who it is. But he got paid a little bit of money for doing that job every week. He also was one that counted the money every week when the offering was taken up. And he would take his right out of the offering plate and stick it in his pocket. I'd never thought that was right. I still don't think that's right. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither is being lords over God's heritage. Whose heritage is it? That means we're not the lords. But being in samples to the flock. And I have insist, I have, I have preached, begged, insisted, that every one of us adults be examples to these young people. You can hurt them. Church members can, can hurt the young people of a church and they'll walk out and they'll never go to a church ever again. Now, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear. You know what that's like? You know what comes to mind? 
It's like when you, when you work a job, like at a restaurant or a store or someplace like that, and everybody's just loafing. And then the manager walks in, or the boss, or the owner. And somebody sounds the alarm. Boss is here! Boss is here! All of a sudden, everybody's got mops and brooms, and everybody's typing, and everybody's digging, and everybody's doing this. Because the chief shepherd's coming one of these days, isn't he? When the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And since we don't know when he's going to appear, you better stay busy all the time. Christianity is not a Sunday only religion. Verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, are you listening, young people? Ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. You know what we was taught growing up? What Lisa and my sister and, and I were taught growing up in this church? You don't go up to Joe as a young person and say, hey, Joe, you don't do that. What do you say? Brother Joe. Hey, Chris. You don't say that. It's Brother Chris. That shows respect. Young people, for elders in your church. And it, and it goes to everybody. Hello, Brother Jim. Now, if you can't say Samarzic, don't worry about it, but I got it down pretty good. But that's what you do. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. And be uh, clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud. Do you know that's why some people don't and won't go to this church ever? Because they believe they ain't got no sins. And they just too proud to admit it. And they'll never come. Unless God breaks them of that pride. I know this. I had so much pride in me. In my younger days, you would have hated me. I was cocky, arrogant. Humble yourselves, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. In verse 7, everybody... That's got problems. Got needs, got issues, stuff going on right now. Look at verse 7. Casting all your care upon him. For he careth for you. Trish, you know what dad asked me to do one time? I was talking to him on the phone. And he said, would you pray for Buster? You remember Buster? Buster was my daddy's dog. And when my dad was a little boy, he had one of them. What, are they, what kind are they? Huh? 
Yeah, it's a big bug-eyed dogs. Boston Terrier. And so after Dad retired, he got a, another one. He got a Boston Terrier, and it was Buster. And that, that was his buddy. That was his retirement buddy. And he asked me to pray for his dog. His dog, them bug eyes, he ran into some thorns and poked, one poked his eye. And eventually, another one went and he lost both eyes. He's a blind dog. And I got off the phone with him and I went, pray for a dog. But then I got to thinking and I started praying and I said, God... I really don't care two cents about that dog. But that dog belongs to my dad. My dad loves that dog. So God, would you heal that dog? That seems like something little, doesn't it? But if you can't trust God for the little things... Why trust him for the big ones? Cast all your cares upon him. For he careth for you. Do you not understand that? Do you know why I'm still here and haven't left? Because I have a God who cares for me. I have a wife who cares for me. Family cares for me. Church people care for me. Other pastors that have said, Mike, don't quit. If they can care for me, I know, I know God cares for me. Casting your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober. Verse 8. There's people in this church that have dealt with addiction issues. They meet from time to time. And we talk. We talk we we talk about what God does for us, what God wants out of us. We do what the Bible says, confessing your faults one to another. It didn't say confess your sins, confessing your faults one to another. And we do that. And I'm part of that group. I've told you all that. And if you think that you need to be part of that, come talk to me. Come talk to me. Because he says, be sober. Now all these churches out here telling you, be drunk in the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And everybody's acting around, jumping all, men laying all over women in the church because they're so, we're drunk in Jesus. No, you're not, you nasty thing. He said, be sober. Do you know why? He said, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Now, why did he? he why, why didn't he say is a roaring lion? Is and not as. Did you ever notice that? He didn't say is a roaring lion. He said as a roaring lion.
Revelation 5. Verse 5, one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Jesus is the lion of Judah. Somebody say amen. And he's not of the... You ought to, know, you ought to find out what the Bible says about the lion back in, about Jesus being a lion back in Isaiah, I think it's somewhere in Isaiah, that says that lion, he's not afraid when the shepherds start looking for him. Bring them on, I'll kill every one of them. That's my Savior and Lord. You, you got an enemy, my Savior becomes a lion. Rock! Where's, where's your enemies? I'll eat them. You know what? Do you know where lions get 95% of the fluid for their body? Blood. They're looking for blood. So now think about this for a minute, people. The roar, if you're drunk, would you be able to tell the difference between a real lion and... Let me tell this joke I heard while I'm giving you this illustration. This guy was looking for a job and sign on the zoo said, now hiring. And they said, what are you, what are you hiring for? I'm looking for a job. And they said, well, come with us. We'll, we'll hire you instantly. So they took him back in this place. And they put this lion suit on him. And uh, they said, all you got to do is go in this lion's pen. Kind of roar around a little bit. You know, and, rawr, rawr, and you know, for the people, they bring their kids by and try to act like a lion. Okay, sounds good to me. So they put that lion suit on him and put him inside there and he's just doing fine, you know. And every time he'd see some, you know, balloons come by with kids and, you know, you know, and they'd act, you know, get all upset and crying and everything like that. And boy, he was just roaring and just everything like that. And all of a sudden he saw another lion over at a tree. And he just froze. He said, man, I am hamburger. I don't know how in the world I'm going to get out of this. So he went, help. Nobody came. Help. Nobody came. Help. The other lion said, would you shut up before we lose both our jobs? So, if there was a real lion and a guy in a lion suit, if you're sober, can you tell the difference? What about when you're drunk? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast. How? That's all you got to do, people, is just keep trusting this book. There is a stupid sign over on a church over here in Hillsboro. And uh, I wanted to take the thing, cut it down, grind a wood up for pulp and print a Bible out of it. Made me mad. It said, and most of these church signs do, it said, If you see the devil, run! That is not what the Bible says. What does it say? I, Melissa, I'll let you answer this. I'll let you prophesy. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. You're the one supposed to stand. Not the devil. You're not the one supposed to run. He is. 
whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions... Listen, listen to me now. You're having problems, right? So am I. Resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So was everybody else. You're not the only one. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after, listen, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen, settle you. That means you ain't going nowhere but up. Amen? You ain't going nowhere but up. And this, I'm going to close with this. This is the last part of the chapter. It's just Peter closing it out. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen? By Silvanus, uh, which was Silas. Paul and Silas. You, you know Paul and Silvanus and Silas are the same. A faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written, briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluted you, as so doth Marcus, my son. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, I want us to have an altar time of prayer. Who wants to come and pray?